Be this as it may, tonight I'm delighted to welcome uh, our academic, uh, to welcome you to our academic lecture. I'd like to uh, thank uh, the South Texas Library and the Mid Valley Campus for sponsoring and hosting this event. Uh, uh, tonight's speaker, of course, is Professor Jan Blitz. Uh, Dr. Blitz is from the University of Delaware, where he has uh, taught in the Honors Program for 40 years. Uh, he's the author of 14 books on Shakespeare, political history, and political philosophy. His most recent book is an annotated edition of A Midsummer Night's Dream. It's a delight. Uh, uh, Dr. Blitz has won the University of Delaware's Excellence in Teaching Awards, the Kirkpatrick Academic Freedom Award for Defending Student and Faculty Rights. He has served as the Secretary of the Navy's Distinguished Fellow at the U.S. Naval Academy, and has lectured on freedom to former Soviet bloc military officers at the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies in Germany. Uh, besides the Midsummer Night's Dream, his editions of Shakespeare include Julius Caesar, Anthony and Cleopatra, Coriolanus, Macbeth, and soon to be released, Hamlet. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jan Blitz. <laughs> Well, thank you. Good evening. I'm delighted to be with you. I want to thank Dr. Smith and his team for inviting me and Dr. Smith for those kind words. I must say that I'm impressed by your annual Shakespeare Festival, especially your combining your college and city in celebrating Shakespeare, as well as in focusing on a single play each year. I think that's the right way to get to the bottom of a Shakespeare play. I regret only that I'm not with you there tonight in person. I'm happy that this year's selection is A Midsummer Night's Dream. It's a wonderfully rich play that charms its readers and viewers, no matter their ages, backgrounds, or walks of life. It is often said to be just a silly romp of foolish young lovers chasing one another through the woods. But the play is really an excellent example of a bright comedy with serious content. What's serious doesn't have to be dismal or dumb. It can be comic. As Shakespeare shows in this play, the playful and the thoughtful can go together very well and enhance each other. I will try to show you that you miss much of the sparkling comedy that Shakespeare put into Midsummer Night's Dream if you don't see the thoughtful side of the play. Let me first say a few words about how best to approach Shakespeare in general. This is something that scholars normally get wrong. I think the most important step is to give full weight to a play's dramatic setting, the particular time and place in which Shakespeare sets the action. Scholars almost always assume that Shakespeare's settings and characters are irrelevant or largely interchangeable from play to play. They typically think that what appears in one play could appear in another almost without change. They think this because they presume that Shakespeare knew only and was interested only in the London of his day. In fact, however, Shakespeare's plays and characters represent specific times and places in history. They depict different cultures and ways of life. Macbeth is a Celtic Scot, Julius Caesar an ancient Roman, and so on. Shakespeare's characters are not merely Englishmen in foreign costumes. Human nature may be the same everywhere and always, <laughs> but Shakespeare's plays show how different ways of life emphasize or suppress different aspects of our shared human nature. They make us different sorts of people, people with different pleasures, <clears throat> pains, loves, fears, hopes, ideas, customs, political orders, sexual practices, standards of right and wrong, and just about everything else you could name. In doing so, different ways of life create different human problems and opportunities. 
Now, looking across Shakespeare's plays, you see this enormously interesting and far-ranging human diversity. Excuse me. To mention the most obvious example, Shakespeare places some plays in Christian settings and others, including A Midsummer Night's Dream, in pre-Christian or pagan times and places. And he shows how the hearts and minds, the lives and the souls of the characters and even the stories themselves are largely shaped by the gods they worship and the things they honor. As the play's audience or readers, we view the play's action from the outside. But Shakespeare, in effect, goes native to present the drama from the inside. So we see the characters as the characters saw themselves. Greeks as Greeks, Romans as Romans, Egyptians as Egyptians, Scots as Scots, Danes and, as Danes, and so on. What about our play this evening? Yeah. A Midsummer Night's Dream is set in ancient Athens. What comes to mind when you think of ancient Athens? That is Athens at its glorious peak in the fifth century BC. Those acquainted with it would list democracy. Athens was the world's first democracy. The flowering of learning and philosophy. Athens, excuse me, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle all taught there. And the celebration of high art, especially the tragic dramas of Euripides, Sophocles, and others who competed for prizes in the city's public festivals. The Midsummer Night's Dream focuses on ancient Athens, but it's not a history play in any usual sense. It's a poetic portrayal with comish embellishments, funny distortions, and ludicrous twists on the nature of ancient Athens and what it stood for, which, as I just mentioned, are the love of the beautiful, the triumph of art, and the rise of democracy. Love, art, and self-rule were the essence of Athens in its peak. One of the play's poetic distortions is the dramatic timing. Instead of portraying Athens at a particular time, as Shakespeare does Rome in his play Julius Caesar, for example, the Midsummer Night's Dream combines two important times, the city's glorious fifth century peak and its founding many centuries earlier. It does this by presenting Theseus as, as, as Athens's ruler at both times. According to ancient writers, the city was founded by Theseus. His heroic action had saved the people from savage murderous enemies, and he gathered the villages around Athens to form the city. The village farmers were at first unwilling to give up their absolute power. So to win their approval, Theseus promised them that he would preserve their ancient privileges and laws if they made him their new ruler. This is crucially important in the play, as we'll see. The play begins with Theseus in exactly this role. In the opening scene, a father named Aegeus comes to him to enforce the law, which he says gives him as a father the authority to marry his daughter to the man he, not she, chooses. And if she refuses, to put her to death on the spot. I beg the ancient privilege of Athens, Aegeus announces, as she is mine, I may dispose of her, which shall be either to this gentleman, the man he prefers and she rejects, or to her death, according to our law, immediately provided in that case. The ancient privilege of Athens crystallizes the state of affairs before Theseus's unification of the villages. Before then, families lived independently in small villages, each worshiping its own ancestors and each governed by a, a sovereign father. Aegeus' phrase, as she is mine, set the standard for everything. Nothing went beyond or above the strictly private circle of one's own family. 
But with the unification of Athens, the preservation of the law passed to Theseus or to civic rule. And, be and Athens became or began to become a union of families under civic law rather than a scattering of families, each governed by a father whose children, quote, should look up to him as a god. But as Jesus' complaint demonstrates, when the play begins, fathers no longer have the unlimited patriarchal power they had prior to Athens' founding. Although his daughter must still accept his choice of a husband, Aegeus can no longer punish her refusal without Theseus's approval. The strictly private realm, the realm of what is narrowly one's own, is now at least partly subject to the rule of public or civic authority. Theseus's response to Aegeus's demands is not quite as grim or as threatening as the father's. He gives the young woman, Hermia, four days until the day of his own eagerly awaited wedding to accept her father's choice or else face not death, but the loveless virginal life of a nun. Quote, to live a barren sister all your life, chanting faint, faint hymns to the cold, fruitless moon. Theseus is a man of strong sexual desire himself and he urges Hermia to consult her own passions in deciding. The final word will not be that of her father, but of her own sexual desires. This marks a major step towards the radical change that is coming. But rather than choosing between a man she does not love and, quote, withering on the virgin thorn, as Theseus puts it, Hermia and Lysander, the man she loves, decide to flee Athens and to go to a place where, free from Athens' patriarchal law, they may marry for love. Their flight gives rise to the young lover's comic romp through the woods. Instead of arriving at the place they had expected, Hermia and Lysander wander in the woods. She is chased by Demetrius, the man she has refused to marry, and Demetrius is chased by the woman he has jilted, Helena, who still loves him, perhaps now more than ever. This chaotic chase among the four lovers creates comical confusions, offensive misunderstandings, and complicated entanglements, all involving love, jealousy, rivalry, anger, insults, taunts, accusations, and sheer mistakes. Quote, the course of true love never did run smooth, as Lysander himself uh, says before they set out. The love's, love's rough road in this instance is made all the rockier by the presence of another group in the woods. These are the fairies, led by the fairy King Ober Oberon and Queen Titania, who are quarreling. The group also includes a quick-witted prankster known as Puck, who loves mischief and gladly serves Oberon. When Oberon happens to see how badly Demetrius is treating Helena, he calls upon Puck to help him set things right by causing Demetrius to fall passionately in love with her. He tells Puck that he once saw Cupid, the Greek god of sexual love, shoot his love arrow, but miss his target. Instead of hitting the chaste young woman he had aimed for, the arrow fell out of favor on a certain, fell out on a certain flower whose juice now contains the irresistible power of Cupid's arrow. Oberon gives Puck some of this magical love juice. He explains that when it's applied to the sleeper's eyes, the ointment makes that person see great beauty in and fall madly in love with the first creature, human or otherwise, that he or she sees upon waking. The juice produ produces love at first sight in its utmost extreme. Despite his good intentions, however, Oberon botches his instructions. He gives Puck a very general description of his intended target causing Puck to apply the love juice to the wrong man, to Lysander, who is already in love with Hermia, 
instead of to the loveless Demetrius. As readers will recall, Huck's mistake only intensifies the comic chaos. Rather than resolving the lover's turmoil, it gives rise to ever more entangling paths, bewildering reversals, continual errors, frequent affronts, and madcap jealousies among the young lovers. Now, much of the play, all of Acts 2 and 3, takes place in the woods. We don't see Theseus after the opening scene until the morning of his wedding day. Then, while celebrating the May Day morning, Theseus, his Amazon bride, Hippolyta, and Hermia's father, Aegeus, come upon the four lovers who, thanks to Puck's correction of his era, are all sleeping peacefully near each other in the woods. When Lysander reveals that he and Hermia had tried to run away, Aegeus cries, enough, 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 and then angrily calls for the law, the law upon his head. Earlier, he wanted Hermia to die. Now it's her lover. However, Theseus quickly rejects Aegeus's furious demand. Upon hearing that Demetrius now loves Helena and Hermia and Lysander love each other, he declares to Aegeus, quote, I will overbear your will, for in the temple by and by with us, these couples shall eternally be knit that is joined in marriage. Theseus overthrows the old privilege of Athenian patriarchy in giving the lovers the freedom to marry as they wish. Overturning rather than preserving the ancient law, as he had promised to do, he liberates a young daughter's romantic desire from her filial duty. The daughter's wishes, not the father's command, now rule. Theseus thus links marriage to love on the one hand and frees it from patriarchal authority on the other. The claims of, of lawful erotic love defeat those of procreation or parenthood. The love of the beautiful overthrows and replaces the love of and authority over one's offspring. Shakespeare takes pains to indicate that Theseus's actions represents the founding of Athens. He does this in part by giving Hermia's father the name Aegeus, a name that Shakespeare's ancient sources give to Theseus's own father. This is, because, this is important because of Theseus's role in his father's death. Theseus' most famous heroic action was his slaying the Minotaur, the ferocious half-human, half-bull monster that every year devoured 14 Athenian youths who were shipped to Crete as tribute for the death of the Cretan king's son. According to legend, Theseus insisted on being one of the 14 so he could face the monster and put an end to the deadly tribute. His father, Aegeus, strongly objected. To lessen his father's worry, Theseus promised that if he survived, his ship would fly a white sail when it returned and a black sail if he had been killed. As events turned out, Theseus failed to put up the white sail and his father, distraught at the sight, threw himself down into the sea. The sea is the Aegean Sea, named after Aegeus. According to Plutarch, Shakespeare's chief source, Theseus, quote, cannot be cleared of patricide. In other words, he bears guilt for killing his father. Midsummer Night's Dream reflects Theseus's action, where the play begins with a father invoking the ancient privilege of Athens to marry his daughter to whatever man he wishes. It ends with that same father absent from his daughter's wedding to the man she loves as though he were dead. Once Theseus overbears his will, Aegeus, the only father in the play, says not another word and disappears from the play with barely a trace. Where Rome is founded on an act of fratricide, Rom Romulus killing his brother Remus, Athens rests on an act of patricide, a son in effect killing his father. Even in the Pyramus and Thisbe play within this play, 
Although the players initially cast an actor to play the father of the heroine, Hermia's direct counterpart, that character's role is missing from the play when the play is finally formed. Shakespeare thus presents Theseus's overthrow of patriarchal authority as, tant as tantamount to his legendary unification of the, of the villages. Former, in fact, brings out the significance of the latter, where it turns Athens from a collection of sovereign fathers who have absolute authority over their families to a union of families in which the city's power can reach family members. By replacing command with choice as the city's fundamental principle and fathers with family as its fundamental component, Theseus's action ties together the themes, the plays themes of love and democracy, laying the groundwork for the full, de full development of democratic Athens centuries later. Before turning to Shakespeare's comic portrayal of Athenian high art, I want to make two comments about the young lovers. These may hit home especially with younger members in the audience. Scholars often say that what makes the lovers chase in the woods so funny or absurd is that the characters they passionately pursue or vehemently re reject are basically the same. Hermia and Helena may differ in height and complexion, but the differences between them, as well as those between the two men, are merely superficial. With all the turmoil, the scholars say, it really makes no difference who marries whom. The marriages and the characters' future lives would be basically the same. Now, I think this conclusion is altogether mistaken. Both men and both women are crucially different from each other. Demetrius is, as Lysander says, a spotted and inconstant man. He courted Helena and won her love, but then dumped her to pursue Hermia when Hermia took an interest in Lysander. Unlike Lysander, Demetrius sees winning a woman's love not as a matter of affection, but of conquest. He's interested in a woman only so long as she's a challenge to him, and he seeks another challenge once he has won her love. It is surely telling that while Oberon removes the love juice from the eyes of others, he leaves it on Demetrius's eyes. He recognizes that without the love juice, Demetrius would never remain true to Helena. And Helena, for her part, has a corresponding trait. Although she is thought to be the most beautiful woman in Athens and is named after the beautiful Helen of Troy, she is constantly comparing herself with Hermia, whom she sees as her rival. And while knowing herself only by comparisons, Helena also thinks that visible beauty alone can win a man's love. He has no clue that her fawning behavior in seeking Demetrius's love only discourages that love. Personal behavior, sometimes called personal character, often makes all the difference in making somebody lovable or unlovable. And I might add that unlike, uh, excuse me, like her famous namesake, Helena is very poor at choosing a husband. My second point concerns Hermia's character. Hermia is named after the Greek god Hermes. As the god of travelers, Hermes is both the transgressor and the preserver of boundaries. He crosses but also respects borderlines. His rival, the god of wine Dionysus, also known as Bacchus, famously blurs and dissolves limits. But in contrast, Hermes maintains hierarchies and distinctions even as he trans transverses them. So too does his namesake, Hermia, who defies her father's authority, yet preserves her own honesty. Though contravening some boundaries, she keeps self-restraint intact, as she shows distinctly when insisting that she and Lysander sleep apart from each other their night in the woods. Let us turn now to the importance of high art in Athens. Drama and democracy arose together in Athens. Theater was a civic spectacle. Plays were meant to educate as well as to entertain the public and were performed under the auspices of the god 
of the god Dionysus, the theater's presiding divinity. The entire city was expected, even required, to attend. The Athenian theater was in many ways a forerunner of your Shakespeare festival. You're an excellent company. Shakespeare highlights the close link between Athenian drama and democracy by introducing a third group of characters in the woods. These are a troop of artisans who were there to plan and rehearse the play they hoped to, hoped to perform for Theseus's wedding celebration. These workmen are the only commoners that Shakespeare shows in democratic Athens. Although they are identified by their various crafts, weaver, tailor, tinker, and so on, none says a word about his trade. Instead, they all not only hope, but expect to make their fortunes by acting. As one of them says, if they had chosen to perform for Theseus, their lead actor, Bottom, would make sixpence a day for life, and we all, in other ads, would be made men. In Theseus's Athens, even artisans, men who, quote, never labored in their minds till now, think of themselves as artists. Bottom and his colleagues seem completely unsuited for their lofty ambition. Of their many shortcomings, probably the most notable and most comical is their basic, basic misunderstanding of their presumed art. They're hard pressed to grasp a theatrical illusion. As you know firsthand, when we see a stage play, we don't suppose that the events on the stage are actually happening. We see them as illusions, as make-believe. We recognize stage action as a fictional representation of events. If someone is murdered in a play, we realize that it is the character, not the actor, who is killed. Instead of taking literally what we see, we watch the drama with a kind of double vision. We at once believe and disbelieve that the action is real. We believe that the actors are and are not their characters. Without this human ability, we would have no theater at all. The artisans, however, are at a loss to grasp such an illusion. They suppose that the audience, or at least the ladies in the audience, will be unable to keep in mind the duality of actor and character, and will assume instead that the two are one and the same. Unable to understand the distinction themselves, the players fear that the ladies in their audience will think that whatever happens on the stage is happening in real life. The play that the artisans intend to perform, Pyramus and Thisbe, portrays a pair of young lovers, much like Hermia and Lysander, who are prevented by their fathers from marrying, so they plan to steal away to get, to get married. The play's tragic plot calls for a grisly lion to appear suddenly and frighten Thisbe when she goes to meet Pyramus. Because they don't understand dramatic illusion, the players are baffled by how to fill the lion's role. They fear that a lion will terrify the ladies in the audience and that the frightened ladies' shrieks will be enough to get all the actors hanged. To avoid this terrible outcome, Bottom proposes including a prologue in which Snug, the actor playing Lion, would step out of his role, show his face through his costume, assure the audience that he is, quote, no such thing as a lion, but is rather, quote, a man as other men are, and then name his name and tell them plainly he is Snug the joiner. Not surprisingly, the players attempt to solve their presumed problem would destroy the play by shattering whatever theatrical illusion they might have managed to retain. A second shortcoming of the play is that they fail to appreciate the wholeness of a drama. The plot of Pyramus and Thisbe reaches a climax when Pyramus, mistakenly thinking that the lion has killed Thisbe, kills himself from deep, deep grief. Since the players fear that suicide is something else that the ladies fear, one of them suggests that they simply leave out the play's tragic climax. To him, a play is not a coherent whole with a beginning, middle, and end, but rather a heap of disjointed parts or episodes, any one, any one of which can be dropped for any reason at all with no loss to the play. Bottom, however, who has the role of Pyramus, does not want to 
omit the suicide because he wants his chance, as he puts it, to move such storms of tears that the audience might try themselves blind. Certain that his performance will win him supreme theatrical acclaim, he suggests keeping the suicide but offering another prologue, quote, let the prologue say that we do no harm with our swords and that Pyramus is not killed. And for better assurance, he adds, quote, tell them that I, Pyramus, am not Pyramus, but Bottom the Weaver. That will put them out of fear. Bottom means to distinguish himself from his character and tell the audience that he is not Pyramus, but merely playing the part of Pyramus. So no one is really being killed. Instead, he says that he both is and is not Pyramus, first identifying himself with his part, I, Pyramus, then distinguishing himself from his part, am not Pyramus. The contrast, in contrast to the previous prologue that Bottom proposes, this one would reinforce the very ambiguity of the drama's double vision that he is needlessly trying to remove. Let me add quickly to avoid misunderstanding that it is the players, not Shakespeare, who have the low opinion of the intelligence and courage of the women in the audience. Ironically, those women include the Amazon queen, Hippolyta. The Amazons are said to be the daughters of Ares, the Greek god of war, Mars in Latin. They are, they are a mythical race of unwed warrior women who conduct all the activities of war and government while assigning the conventional domestic duties of women to the men they conquer. Hippolyta, who led the Amazons' attack on Athens and was Theseus's equal in battle, is said to be the first Amazon ever to marry. Far from sharing the player's misogynist opinion, Shakespeare, in fact, turns it around and in the same context, points up the player's own fearful unmanliness, the jokes on them. The players finally get to perform to Theseus and the other newlyweds. Philostrata, Theseus's, as Dr. Smith said, manager of mirth, warns him not to choose the artisan's play unless he wants just to laugh at their ludicrous ineptitude. Theseus, however, chooses the play not to laugh at it, he says, but out of respect for the sincerity and duty of the players offering it. He says that he will judge the actors in the light of their ability, not their achievement. The harder they try, the less fault he will find. The more the players attempt to surpass their limited abilities, he says, the greater will be his kindness in giving them thanks. Yet despite this noble promise, this is not at all what happens. At the very first opportunity, Theseus mocks the players, and he and the other members uh, of the onstage audience keep doing so throughout the Pyramus and Thisbe performance. This stark about face, which readers and viewers find very puzzling, is not Shakespeare's blunder, as critics usually suppose. On the contrary, it shows, Sh it shows Shakespeare's skill in drawing attention to the significance of the artisan's misunderstanding of their art. It highlights their lack of what I've called double vision, their inability both to keep together and to keep apart the actor and his character. Whereas we have already seen, an actor both is and is not his character. The onstage audiences, though taking their cue from the players, separate the actor from the character completely. They proceed as if the characters were not in any sense the actors. They feel free to mock the actors without breaking Theseus's promise not, not to humiliate them because they assume, or act as though they assume, that the actors whom they ridicule are absent and only the characters are present to hear their mocking. They speak, in effect, behind the actors' backs, as though Pyramus might hear them, but Bottom cannot. Shakespeare's presentation of the onstage on stage audience's incivility is thus a parody of the artisan's literalness on the one hand and their pretension to, to high art on the other. I stress this puzzling episode because I think it shows how Shakespeare intends us to read his plays. Many of Shakespeare's plays have puzzles like this one. Scholars tend to view them as Shakespeare's poetic lapses. Here that he somehow forgot what he had written even emphasized just 10 lines earlier. 
However, I think that Shakespeare uses such intentional puzzles as clues to his full meaning. They are his prompts or signals for us to stop and think, to put two and two together, and to think through the, what the puzzles indicate about the substance of the play as a whole. Far from being Shakespeare's stumbles, these puzzles show his great poetic skill in leading a thoughtful reader to grasp fundamental philosophical issues that he has written into his plays. Here the puzzle sets forth in comic fashion the serious import of what I've called double vision. Double vision is a crucial theme in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Hermia's two dreams when sleeping in the woods center on it. Her first dream is a nightmare. He dreams that a serpent ate her heart and Lysander did nothing but sit and smile at the snakes trying, preying upon her. What a dream was here, she exclaims when she wakes up. When we dream, we become literal minded and take a likeness for the thing itself. It is only after waking up that we recognize the dream as a dream, as Hermia does here. Hermia's second dream occurs just before Theseus and the others come upon the four lovers asleep in the woods. Soon after waking, she says, quote, methinks I see these things with parted eye when everything seems double. Hermia refers as before to the doubleness of her recognizing a dream as a dream upon waking up. Awake, we distinguish an image from, an, from a reality. When dreaming, we do not. Hermia, at the same time, points more generally, as A Midsummer Night's Dream does as a whole, the double vision natural and essential to human thinking. With our body's eye, we see what is before us. With our mind's eye, we see what it means. Our natural parted eye permits us to recognize a likeness as a likeness, an image as an image. Able to see that there's more than meets the eye, you're able to separate the site's significance from the site itself, the reality or the meaning from the appearance. As a result, we are able, as Hermia does here, to step back and reflect on our sensing. He thinks I see, as she says. And in the same way, we can also, among countless other vital human abilities, generalize, grasp implications, see something as something else, speak in metaphors, play on words, use or discover deceptions, pretend to be this or that, be ironic or sarcastic, and indeed have poetry or theater at all. Nor would we have love. As Shakespeare shows, when lovers see their beloved, they tend to see beyond the beloved, even beyond the visible world. When Demetrius wakes up with love juice on his eyes and sees Helena, he exclaims, quote, Oh, Helen, goddess, nymph, perfect, divine. He believes he sees what no one else can really see. Theseus accordingly groups together lovers, lunatics, and poets. All of them, he says, see things that are not really there. The madman sees more devils than hell can hold. The lover, just as crazy, sees the beauty of Helen of Troy in a homely face. And the poet projects onto the world such creatures that he has invented and do not exist in the world. All three, Theseus says, with a wonderful pun, have seething brains. Their boiling brains cause them to see things in the sense that we mean when we say that someone is, quote, just seeing things. They imagine that they see things in the world that exist only in their minds. Helena emphasizes this point specifically about love. Explaining why she loves Demetrius despite knowing that he does not merit her love, she says, quote, things vile and base, holding no quantity, love can transpose to form and dignity, end quote. Love, she says, transforms its object, creating excellent and worthy qualities out of ones that have no relation to love's estimation. Love may lie in the eyes, as she and Hermia repeatedly stress, but it looks not with the eyes, but with the imagination. Where sight is normally receptive, under the spell of love, it becomes projective. It transforms its object 
by casting an imaginary form on what the lover sees. As a result, the lover may see what perhaps no one else in the world sees. How many times have you heard somebody wonder, what does she see in him or he see in her? Love does more than transform its object. It first beautifies or idealizes its object, but then typically denies that it is embellishing. Owing precisely to the, to the strength of its spell, it claims with complete certainty that it does not adorn or transform, but sees its object faithfully. In the extremely funny scene depicted so well on uh, Miss Santos's excellent festival flyer, the fairy queen Titania makes this stand out. After Oberon, who's angry at her, has put love juice on her eyes, and Puck has mischief mischievously put an ass's head on Bottom, Titania waking up and seeing Bottom immediately exclaims, quote, so is my eye enthralled to thy shape and thy fair virtues force her force doth move me on first view to say, to swear I love thee. Having beautified its object, love takes its idealization at face value. It becomes absolutely certain of and passionately devoted to the beauty or the perfection that it and perhaps no one else sees. This I want to emphasize is not a defect of love, but one of its truly wonderful charms. You might wonder what the world would be without it. Far less enchanting, I'm sure. Let me conclude by returning to Theseus's disparagement of poetry or art as mere madness. His judgment may seem surprising since Theseus is, after all, the founder of the ancient city rena renowned above all others for the love of the beautiful and the high accomplishments of art. But as Shakespeare shows, in a most important way, Athens as founder does not fit into the city that he founds. The hero whose actions make Athens possible and who is himself so much is and is himself the subject of so much of Athens's great art has no taste for art. He is, to put it simply, anti-poetic, anti-art. As a heroic warrior, he appreciates deeds, not poems, action, not imitation. Only what is tactile is real for him. Theseus accordingly fails to recognize the strong connection between imagination, even dreams, and action. As he himself perfectly exemplifies, first we dream or imagine of what we will do, and then we do it. Plutarch, Shakespeare's major source, makes this explicit. Theseus, he writes, admired the valor of Hercules so much that by night his dreams were of the hero's achievements, and by day his zeal led him forward and spurred his determination to achieve the like. Just as poetry imitates men's deeds, men's deeds in turn imitate poetry. The traffic runs both ways. Contrary to Theseus's disparagement, noble action is not the opposite, but rather an imitation of good poetry. It both is inspired by and inspires high art. In a word, Shakespeare's plays, far from reading from leading readers, especially young readers, away from an active life are on the contrary, a spur to and a source of a life of ambitious, noble action. Thank you for coming out to listen to this. I began the talk by saying that comedy can be serious. I hope that I've shown that that, it, that, that is true of A Midsummer Night's Dream, both Shakespeare's Shakespeare's thoughtful insights on human experience and the unsurpassed literary skill and his unsurpassed literary skill inspire me. I hope they inspire you too. I look forward to your comments and questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll always start with uh, student questions first. Uh, any student questions, what student questions we have? Put you guys on the okay, spot. Then we'll uh, <laughs> we'll generally uh, questions. Uh, 
Okay, uh, uh, I was wondering if you could clarify for me, uh, Professor Blitz, uh, the connection. That how does love of the beautiful make for strong, perhaps even uh, heroic politics? Can you clarify that for us? Make for, I didn't hear the end of that. A heroic or strong politics. Public life. How does, how does the love of the beautiful make yeah. for strong or... Athens is famous for being a, a, a great city. How did the love of the beautiful generate that, cause that? Yeah, uh, that's uh, a wide, a wide-ranging question. Uh, it's probably worth pointing out that for the Greeks, the word noble means beautiful. For the Romans, it means something else. It means decorous or beautiful, but for for the for the Greeks, it means uh, noble means beautiful, and so the difference between your life devoted to the beautiful and your life devoted to the noble is not so clear for for the Greeks, uh, for the Athenians in particular, uh, and uh, in. The comparison with Rome is helpful in a number of ways. One of them is, in Rome, there's nothing higher than political life. The highest goods are political honor. In Athens, politics is not the highest. There's something higher, philosophy, art, and they're combined by the element of the beautiful. Uh, poetry is beautiful. Philosophy is beautiful. Certainly the artwork of the Acropolis is beautiful. The city is devoted to beauty. And in fact, there's a famous passage by Pericles in uh, his famous funeral oration that Athens loves the beautiful without softness. And I think that's true. They, they love beauty, whether that's a beautiful face or a beautiful deed and at the same time are not wimps. Does that answer your question? So it's, it's by being able to uh, aspire to greatness that they're able to, beautiful examples, let's say Hercules, or aspiring to be like Hercules, that, that Athenians were, is that, is that what Shakespeare is trying to teach there? That, that, by having beautiful examples, they, they can imitate that? Yeah, uh, that becomes a little tricky because it's Theseus who's inspired by Hercules. And that's for heroic greatness. But once you, you, once you establish a city, you don't want citizens uh, seeking heroic glory because they're, they may save the city, but they could also be enemies of the city. Shakespeare's play Coriolanus is, illustrates that very, very well. Uh, yeah, the same, there's a certain distance that they have from the city. They're not devoted to the city in the same way that a good citizen would be. So once, once Theseus becomes civilized, and we see that in the play, uh, we have references to his early heroic days, and among other things, that includes treating women terribly. Uh, uh, that's brought out in the play. Uh, he's just terrible with 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 women. Uh, but we see, we see in the play that he's become civilized, and he marries, and he can't wait four days until his wedding day. That tells you something about his having moderated his sexual desire. He's eager, but patient. That never happened before. So you get a change from the pre-civilized to the civilized. And that's shown in the play in scenes that I didn't talk about. Uh, it's brought out rather clearly, but uh, a civilized Athens is very different from, a, from the life of Theseus before 
Athens was civilized, just as this the city is 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 uh, used to be villages and not a city, and in those villages the fathers ruled like tyrants. Uh, they were told the daughters and sons were told to think of their fathers as gods. Once the city becomes civilized, that's gone, and the heroic zeal of uh, of Theseus goes with it. It becomes civilized. Thank you. Uh, Professor Carl Scott, uh, he asks, uh, any significance of Lysander and Demetrius both having names of men who in Plutarch conquer Athens? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really interesting that all of the Athenian men in the play are named after warriors. Uh, the only exception is Philostrata, the manager of mirth, whose name means love of battle. Two of the two of the uh, lovers are named after uh, those men who have defeated Athens. But what's more important, I think. <laughs> That's true. What's more important, though, is what Plutarch says about the two men. Demetrius, the one who uh, is inconstant and needs the love juice on his eyes, he, and who is favored by the father, Aegeus, he inherits his empire. Lysander, a Spartan in Plutarch, uh, who conquers Athens, uh, does it on his own virtue. He deserves victory. Demetrius just inherits it. And that's exactly what we see about them in the play. Lysander is an admirable young man. Demetrius is not. And he depends on inheritance, not on his own virtue. Thank you. Um... Uh, question from our other question from our audience. Uh, Theseus's Theseus's fundamental change to the marriage laws of Athens seems to depend on the chance event of Oberon and Puck making Demetrius fall back in love with Helena. Could you comment on this, please? Yeah, uh, it's very interesting. By the way, in, in just about every Shakespeare play, but certainly in this one to see the element of chance. How many events depend on chance? Uh, and the decisive ones in this play do. Uh, accidents, chance, mistakes, just all sorts of things. And I think one can say that that's a very important distinction between theater or drama and life. In drama, all the accidents fit together. From the point of view of the characters, yes, it's an accident. Uh, Oberon gave Puck the, a misleading description of whom to apply the love juice to. But within the, but to the audience, it makes perfect sense as an accident. And the play fits together with these accidents as accidents, but to the characters in the play, they're like any accident or chance in life, not something you can really understand or explain. In, in life, many events depend on chance. In the theater, or as I said, in drama, they will, but to the audience, they make perfect sense. To the characters, they're as puzzling as those as chance events are to you and me. Thank you. Uh, Professor Massimoni. Excuse me, I, 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 I can make that point somewhat more, more simply. Uh, life is not a stage script. In life, the end does not, the outcome does not determine everything that happens along the way. 
Uh, in, in a stage play, it does. Thank you. Uh, Professor Massimoni? Well, I had this question that my student asked me a long time ago when I could not answer the question. Uh, the question is, why is Theseus the Duke when we don't have that in ancient Greek or, you know, in, in Greek society, but Shakespeare makes him the Duke? Uh, actually, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you'll be able to answer that easily, yeah. Yeah, uh, a Duke. Why, why, why does he have the title of Duke? Uh, Duke is a, is a very general word. It means... Uh, powerful, a leader. I, I think the, uh, oh, I, I should say, uh, one of the young lovers refers to his royal, to Theseus's royal walks. That means he's a king. I think, though, to answer your, your question specifically, Shakespeare leaves out all of the political offices. The only office or anything like an office, the title of Duke, sure, but uh, is manager of mirth. Uh, the political is both everywhere in the play and nowhere in the play. The private life in Athens, or one's private life in Athens, is superior to any political life. In Rome, it's just the opposite. And so what you see is the founding of Athens without mentioning any political office uh, that one could easily identify. You have fathers, yes, but that's not a political office. And you have the manager of mirth, and you have Theseus as Duke, which means just powerful. Uh, and, and, and in many cases, by the way, Shakespeare, it's a synonym for king. But it's not the word king. You're perfectly right. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. You think so? Uh, okay. I think you also made the point in, in the Soul of Athens, didn't you, that that to an Elizabethan audience, the, uh, uh, the, the there was a uh, dukedom under the Ottoman Empire, the dukedom of, of, of Athens uh, that had persisted uh, up until just a couple hundred years before the uh, uh, the play might have been written so that it would just carry over. It would be fairly natural for an Elizabethan audience. Uh, thank oh, you. No, that actually, wasn't... Oh, I'm sorry, it wasn't you. It was. Um, no, that's uh, right. That was, um, uh, that was another book I was reading. Sorry, that's another book I was reading. I'm sorry. Don't be uh, sorry. Thank I'm you. Um, <laughs> uh, that's in. Um, that's an Asimov's guide to uh, Asimov's guide to uh, uh, the plays. I'm sorry. Um, no, good. Uh, that's uh, fine. So, yeah, to, to the place. Um, I'll take all the credit you want. <laughs> Being confused with Asimov, that's a, that's a compliment. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, uh, other question. Oh, sorry. There's um, one in the chat, yes. Uh, how are we to understand the fairies in the play? These seem to be the, uh, seem, these seem to be medieval things that don't fit in Athens or ancient Greece. Are they real or imaginary? Are there are they someone's dream? Why are the fairies so central in this play? Yeah, uh, look to put it perhaps too too simply, they realm, they ruled the realm of imagination. Uh, with them, all the laws of necessity, cause and effect, time, place all the rest are suspended. They really, uh, you know, they're, they're imaginary, but they're also creatures of imagination. And they bring out, uh, as runs through the whole play, the, the importance of imagination, especially in love, but not only in love, in human life. And that's the double vision that I, that I, that I talk about uh, is is that true to life in Athens? No. Uh, it's it's Shakespeare's make believe. It's you know his his poetic uh, embellishment. 
and it's 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 very interesting uh what what is not real about them or signs that they're not real uh i'll give one example uh or actually two come to mind one is uh titania the queen of the fairies gives an account of the floods and the other upheaval that have followed her quarreling with Oberon. Oberon's quarreling with her. She blames him for the floods. Uh, the crops die, this happens, that happens. The play shows that that was never, that that never happened. How can the fairies put dew drops on, on flowers that are flooded? No one hesitates to go into the woods. No one says anything about floods or any of the other things that she, the horrors that she mentions. Uh, it's with it's fiction within the fiction of the play. It's simply make believe. Uh, the the other example, which gets to your uh, festival poster is the episode of Titania falling in love with Bottom, who's got a, the, the, the head of an, of an ass on him. Uh, did that ever take place? Bottom is not sure. He doesn't, he, he's the only one who has seen any of the fairies, but it's not so clear the way he presents it that he has really seen what we see. And then we hear Philostrata three times emphasize that he has seen the whole Pyramus and Thisbe play rehearsed. Three times he's heard it in full. What do we see? We see it interrupted after 10 lines when Puck performs his mischief and that ends up with the ass's head on bottom what we see in fairyland thanks to the fairies shakespeare says never took place so i think that says a lot about fairyland it's completely make believe the characters the fairies are imaginary figures who then have effect on people's imagination. I hope that makes some sense. If not, uh, tell me and I'll try to do better. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you started off with, uh, I guess, the Shakespearean take on the social contract with the uh, movement from the state of nature into civilization. Did, was Shakespeare a contemporary of Jean Baudin? Uh, well, as far as Theseus, uh, the, the, the embodiment of a, a man who is transitioning from pre-civilization to civilization, and in doing so becomes a type of domesticated uh, member of the state or uh, civilized society. Uh, so is, is that, is that kind of like Shakespeare's own take on the, the social contract? Well, uh, I, I'd be careful about terms like the social contract and the state of nature. They, first of all, they come pretty much after Shakespeare, but they, they also presuppose a lot. Uh, you know, if you're thinking of Hobbes, Locke, and others, uh, that's not that's not the same thing as pre-civilized or barbarian. Now you might say, well, the barbarian world was in effect the war of all against all. Uh, you know, so th there might be something, but you have to be careful. Don't force philosophical terms onto Shakespeare. And by the way, I would say this is uh, contrary to a lot of others who have written 
rather well on, on Shakespeare. Don't try to understand Shakespeare in light of another philosopher. It's always a distortion of both Shakespeare and that philosopher. People do it all the time. Uh, it's Plato on the stage. It's Machiavelli on the stage. It's, uh, you know, pick your own philosopher. <laughs> uh, but I think that misses the point. And it really fails to take Shakespeare seriously as a thinker. It makes him derivative, and he's not. So, uh, but but I, I would emphasize, and I think your question emphasized, the passage from pre-civilized to civilized is very important in the play. Uh, uh, th there's in, in the same scene where Theseus, Hippolyta, and Aegeus come upon the young lovers in the woods uh, before they get there. Hippolyta tells about her life with hunting with Cadmus and uh, Hercules. And you get uh, Cad Cadmus, by the way, lived, you know, it's guessed some 800 years before the Trojan War and introduced the alphabet to Greece. That shows you how early that was. She went hunting with him. And now we see she's in Theseus's Athens or uh, uh, Athens at its peak. Time is completely collapsed. And she and Theseus give a sequence of changes involving their dogs and their hunting. And I think you can see that there's a sequence and you get a passage from the barbaric early pre-civilized days to civilized Athens. It's, uh, as far as I know, no other writer has ever <laughs> seen that in the play, but, but once you see it, I think it's unmistakable. And it begins with uh, Cadmus and Hercules and it ends with civilized Athens. And it's it's a series of steps. And uh, it's not very long. And I think you can see the transformation of Athens. Uh, you know, I, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go, go on, go on. I was gonna ask a different question. I guess I was fascinated by the idea of both liberalizing and civilizing love at the same time. Uh, that seems like a, uh, you're going in two different directions simultaneously. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could clarify that for us. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, what you get in the play is liberating love and connecting it to marriage. And that's very, very important that it's not simply liberated, nor on the other hand is it simply marriage. It's marriage, a different kind of marriage than there had been, and on the other hand, uh, love is channeled in, into, into marriage. And that's crucial. Family is retained, but the father is not the tyrant. There's no other questions. I'd, I'd like to say uh, any, any more questions. No, uh, I would just like to encourage the young people in here. I know we use fancy words sometimes, and it sounds very academic. But this love language has transcended time. And this whole time, I'm like, it's complicated. Who hasn't had a bad relationship? Who hasn't been confused by love? Don't feel like you can't ask a question just about generally the subject. And why did he write so much about love? Use your voice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, they're a uh, good class that I have, but they're painful. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, the, okay. the play. No, I was, I was just about to say the play 
appeals to all sorts of people, but I think especially young people. That really is the heart of the play. Okay, uh, if there's no other questions, any more questions online? I'm sorry. Uh, okay, uh, well, I'd, uh, I'd like to thank uh, once again Professor uh, Blitz. Um, uh, it was a wonderful talk, and uh, thank you all for coming out. Uh, once again, thank you very much. <laughs>